Uh, why don't you introduce yourself so that we can see if your screen will get bigger. Okay. There well, you are. Perfect. Okay. Nice yes. okay. <laughs> Excellent. You want me to start on this first uh, Go ahead film? and, yeah, why don't you okay. go ahead and start. It, it needs, oh. yeah. There. <laughs> well, I'd like to really thank uh, Phil. Um, it was yeah. really, I had a great time with Phil. I really enjoyed our time together and uh, it was really interesting. We talked about when we walked to school from Mountain View and down Grand Avenue and mm -hmm. rode our bikes. And I haven't talked to Phil in a lot of years. So <laughs> it was really fun working with him and, and we talked about other stuff. It was really great. Uh, this, this film coming up is um, an interview by Marin... Marin Live, or I, I forget what it was, but it's with Leslie Stovall, who does interviews. And it was done in San Quentin from my house. And she just talks for four minutes with me about Eye of the Storm, a uh, documentary that was filmed outside of San Quentin on the biggest execution ever, biggest crowd protest ever. On, um, on December, in December uh, 2005. So uh, one thing I want to say is when they play, when, when the film or the video plays on uh, Zoom, it has to, Phil was explaining to me, it has to upload and then you're uploading Zoom and download this and upload this and it comes out like, uh, almost like the Three Stooges or like, uh, <laughs> it comes out a little bit funny. So anytime you're ready, Lauren, we'll play the first one if you like. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Kramer. Hi, this is Leslie Stovall from Marin Live Now, and we're taking kind of a, a serious turn. With me in the studio today is Kramer Herzog. He's an award-winning filmmaker, and he made a documentary about San Quentin called Eye of the Storm, which, which I saw, and I felt it was, um, it was very moving. And you have an interesting angle, you know. Just tell us a little bit about your film, because I, I just think it's a, your insight is just brilliant. Uh, my angle on this particular film was uh, it was a demonstration, the biggest demonstration ever in, in front of San Quentin Prison during um, Stanley Cookie Williams was a person that they were going to execute. Yes, if I'm alive, I can always strive forward to uh, prove my innocence. Stanley Tukey Williams will be executed here at San Quentin Prison in just a matter of hours. Perhaps. Six murders. If it wasn't six, it was, then it was four, at least four murders. And that's why he was in San Quentin prison on death row. On death row. And, and how long was he on death row? 23 years, roughly. Wow. I live in San Quentin Village, and most people don't know that's, that's a village outside the gates of San Quentin. Those little sweet houses right there? I, I thought that was guards' houses. Most people we do. Rumors. We hear rumors about riots in LA, riots here, riots everywhere. But I can't imagine people rioting in this town. Yeah. It's um, ghoulish. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's ghoulish. I'm waiting for someone to be put to death. Uh, or yeah. Not put to death, and it's almost weird. But, you know, you, what, let me just describe the scene a little yeah. bit here. There's, you know, probably 200 media um, ghoulies around right. um, with their big tall sticks and their, you know, microwave satellite uh, everybody's doing the and then you contrast it with the gingerbread houses and then around the corner from us is this breathtaking vista of the bay it's beautiful of the san francisco it's bay a stark contrast fox national news came and i uh, made a deal with them that they could use my house i'd give them parking on my grass and so forth for the big satellite trucks mm. and the producers from the east coast and from los angeles came in and did, the Eye of the Storm is the name of the documentary. Also, my house was the Eye of the Storm. Because every time they went out and they did a live show, they'd come back to my house to 
just to relax. I, I don't. I just don't want to stand right up against you. Uh, well, if I stand right got, here, I'm in his light. Right. So I'm asking for a foot. I'm, well, we're, we're, we, we've given you what we can give you. And that, you know that NBC paid for this area right through here? And we actually made a deal with them to be here? Oh, no, I did not know that. I was being nice to them. Hell no! It, it got violent. What do you mean? Well, there was the demonstrators, uh, the most, there was 15. Was it anti-execution demonstrators? Or? Most of them were against um, the execution. And there was a couple there that were for the execution. America has never reached our finest hour. And there would be screaming, yelling, uh, people try to steal my camera, uh, try to take my battery off the back, no matter who. Why? That's a good question, why? I looked through my viewfinder and I noticed that it was like a mirror, that I could see people behind me. And after being shoved and pushed and my camera being ripped from me and I get it, got it back, I was always watching that mirror, looking for who's gonna attack me next. Your film is very compelling and as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. So let's tell them again the name of the, the film. Mm, thank you, let's tell them again. The okay. Eye of the Storm. Okay. So, Trainer, can we watch that on YouTube or something? Yeah, there's several ways you can do it. If uh, you, One, you can email me um, and I can give you a list of, send you a list of films, other films. Two, you can go to YouTube and then we're asked, um, what do you want to see? And then you type under, type in Kramer Herzog and it will come up with a list of different films. Okay. Um, and actually there's some, a lot of other ones that aren't on there that if you email me, I can send you that um, are pretty interesting, I, I think. They're just fun to watch. Listen back. Listen back. Mm -hmm. I, I have some of, uh, called the, the gals of the 50s, um, different people, um, different photographs I took and sleepers and cars and all different stuff like that. Um, if you're interested in that. And uh, and then I have one on John and Pete, John Allaire and Pete Lynn um, okay. about their band and their playing and some well-known international people talking about how good uh, John and Pete are. Yeah. So if you'd like to, that'd be, be fun. <coughs> yeah, um, go ahead and do that, Kramer. Hey. Sure. Uh, Kramer? Yeah. This is Georgia Price. Um, when, you were, when you were interviewing uh, the lady and talking about it, were you on McKenzie Street? Oh, good call. Um, I know, was on the corner of Maine and McKenzie. So yeah. it was on Maine. Yeah, I was on the corner of Maine. Uh, Maine. I thought he recognized it. My husband uh, grew up on that street in the house. Oh, he did? Below. Yeah, above that. My on McKenzie? Yeah, I mean, he lived with his grandparents for a long time on McKenzie Street. Mm. Let me ask you a quick question here. Is, is that... Um, Georgine? Georgine, is it the Zublers? Yeah, this is Duffy's, yeah. Yeah, Duffy's place, Duffy's house, yes, is that right? Duffy's house. Yeah, here, oh, he's wow. Is this uh, Kramer? Yeah. Jim Price. Hi. So, uh, were you at the Gray House on McKenzie Street when you were yes. uh, filming? Okay, that's the house I grew up in. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, did actually, I, actually, did I feed you well? Did, did I <laughs> feed you right? Feed you well? Oh, well, <laughs> actually, it's. Uh, it's it's not the house I grew up in. It's a new house on top of the house that I grew up in, and I think only one wall is the same. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, one of these uh, remodels that was really a new house. Right. Yeah. Leave just leave one room and tear out everything else. And so, do you live there now? No. No, I moved out of there uh, about eight years ago. I think. 
Right. Okay. Well, that house belonged to my uh, uh, to my uh, uncle Don Zubler. Oh, what a small world. Yeah, yeah. and uh, then uh, his daughter sold it, and it was uh, completely remodeled or rebuilt. But uh, right. That house was built in uh, 1860. In the 1860s, just the first uh, uh, front part of it. And uh, I lived there from uh, 1946 until I went to college in 1959. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't know that. This is great. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just, I recognized immediately. I knew that I saw the top of the house down below us and uh, I knew exactly, I knew exactly where you were. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Great. Hey, th thanks, Jim. Okay. So what else do you have for us, Kramer? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, um, one moment. You want your second film? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll okay. roll it. <laughs> yeah. And, and Some people on the outside think that the uh, activities on the lower yard are frivolous. Um, it's, it's my opinion, and I think the opinion of uh, other correctional officers here, is that they provide a major benefit to not only the inmates, but to the correctional staff as well. They, it provides unity amongst the races. It provides leadership and, and teamwork amongst the individuals involved, which makes our life on the lower yard and in prison in general. Uh, much easier to deal with. I'm Jill Brown. I'm the warden of San Quentin State Prison. We're here at the Count Gate, which is the official entrance to San Quentin's security area, and we're here welcoming the Oaks baseball team for opening day with the San Quentin Giants. Let's go play ball. I love the game of baseball, and and level threes and level fours, in which I came from, level three and level four, they consider maximum security prisons. They're real strict, and it's, the, the programs is real limited. The sports the activities is real limited. So when I came to San Quentin, I heard that it was a baseball, a real hardball baseball league. And uh, I, was, I, was, I, just, I was blown away. You know, and to giving me the opportunity, the coaches, the administration, uh, it taught me discipline. It taught me how, in, in the high levels, I was like isolated. I was in a box. A lot of people I didn't associate with as far as different, outside my races, different colors. And this baseball league here has taught me to appreciate everybody, no matter what color you is. If you're on the team, no matter what color you are, you're my brother. We one team. We lose together, we win together. You must have good behavior. That's what you, you, you can't be getting rolled up, getting in all kind of trouble to be on this team. The San Quentin Giants, we're a team with integrity. You know, we stand up men. You know, we're some of the, the, the best inmates in this prison. Is this a bag of balls to do some? My name is Loretta Conway. I am the Director of Development for the United States Tennis Association Northern California section. I'm very proud to be part of the rehabilitation of, of sports here with tennis. There's a lot of different stories that are in this prison, and I know that sports is helping people. The guards are telling me that tennis and baseball and some of the other sports are actually helping the men get along better with the guards, the men get along better with their families. When they get out on parole, they're now encouraging their own family members to play sports because it's done so much for them while they're here. So it's just very rewarding to be part of this. I think the most, the most important thing is, is that with tennis, there's rules. And most of us are in prison because we couldn't follow the rules. 
So by playing tennis, we don't have any line judges. We have to call our own shots. Uh, it helps you to deal with controversy if you disagree with the shot that's been called rather than then take an aggressive nature, we can just play the point over again. It has given me um, an outlet, I say, of the anger that, that's within inside these prison walls. Tennis not being just a game to us. Tennis for us is a, is a lifeline, really. We are, uh, uh, for the most part, violent men that came to prison for violent crimes. And uh, tennis is a tool for us to, to it's like a therapy for us to learn to apply our new, uh, newly acquired skills. So every time that, that I come to the tennis court, for me, it's like going to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. When we're here, it's not just a game. We're growing up as men. All right, Rafael, bring it on. I didn't want to come when they first invited me. I was scared, like most people. I had conceptions about how it would be. They come in with one perception. When they first come in, we're all bad guys. By the time they leave, they find out we're just as human as everybody else. Kramer, hey, you. When, my, when my oldest son um, was younger, uh, he played Little League at San Quentin. And um, when we came through the gates to bring him in, um, they checked our trunk when we went in and when we went out, just to make sure we had no other precious cargo with us. That's right. <laughs> but it was That's such true. a great program out there. It was just, it was awesome. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I well, Grant, I took a tour of San Quentin. I think it was one of the last public tours that they had. And I remember being in the in interior courtyard and the guards were saying, don't look up because you know, you're looking up, you're looking up and you're not supposed to at all the jail facilities. So the inmates all grabbed the bars and started hooting like monkeys, you know, <laughs> whoo, 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 real loud. And and they just said, stay calm, don't look up. They're just trying to get your attention and make a... Right. And then we had dinner there. And <laughs> um, this was at the time of the Jackson 5. And so they were asking about all the news from the outside, you know, what's going on. And, you know, when you're in line in the cafeteria. And, and um, you know, those people were being trained to be chefs when they got out, or cooks, I can't say a chef, but a cook. And I remember my dad, when he had the Griddle restaurant, he hired a couple of guys that had left um, San Quentin and worked wow. for him. So yeah, they, they tried interesting programs. Now that's going back to the you know, late 50s, you know? Yeah. When yeah. Going on, even then, it wasn't as elaborate as it became, but. And my dad they, taught um, school there. They also played baseball oh. with yeah. down there with Kent. Yeah. Yeah. And my dad taught night school yeah. out at the prison. And I still have to this day a leather purse that the inmates carved for my mom. Oh. It's absolutely beautiful. And I have it very safely tucked away. There are some wonderful people who were there yeah. and yeah. hopefully made a lot of <coughs> their lives after they got out. Maybe they learned good lessons somehow. I have a, a painting of San Quentin Cove before any houses were there. And then, yeah. And then there's a, um, when my brother, I guess it had to be the early 50s, he used to know the Cheatham family. Remember that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was friends with the older brother and he would go down there and they had guard houses at that time, probably Kramer and uh, Dana, where your homes are in that area. And that's where they lived. They lived outside the gates in the these little houses that they had. So that's what our memories serves. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Art. Right. Thank you. So, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, R. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of fun stuff that goes on in San Quentin. Uh, I'm <laughs> so sorry that that uh, that video doesn't come in good. So if you want to see uh, see it, and there's some great sound bites in there, um, especially at the end when the the guy uh, who said everyone that comes in here thinks we're all bad guys, but yeah. when they leave, they know we're not. Yeah. And and one interesting thing was. Um, the National Tennis Association saw this uh, short documentary I did, and um, they came out to San Quentin and interviewed one of the guys that I was interviewing, mm. and put put him on the cover of a tennis magazine and a big article about him. Oh, really? How, Wonderful. Yeah, and the article really was uh, how tennis to him showed him their rules and. We abide by the rules oh. in this tennis game. So that it taught them quite a bit. And baseball was very strict. If you didn't if you didn't abide by the rules, you'd be kicked off. They had really strict and everybody had a nickname. Oh. Everybody. <laughs> Can you share? <laughs> uh, well, Stretch was a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's some other ones that I can share. <laughs> Well, and, and, we probably have a couple more minutes to uh, uh, to listen to about Johnny and Pete. If you have something uh, there that you want to share, uh, well, that was interesting. Pete Lynn called me up years ago, and and he, there was a, a documentary that came out about him tw about twenty minutes, and it was an excellent documentary. It was by a guy, <clears throat> excuse me, that lived out in uh, West Marin. Mm -hmm. Who's Academy Award winner? Uh, won Academy Award for documentary. Uh, Jonathan, I forget his last name at the moment, and he did one on Pete Lynn. And Pete Lynn's been, uh, uh, excuse me, John Allaire has been tuning his piano, but the husband, the filmmaker husband, didn't know it. And one day he came in and saw Johnny tuning the piano. And was so interested in in this guy and the way he works and tunes pianos and plays and he went out and made a, a great 20 minute documentary oh, but nice. it and it it previewed at the Rafael theater which everybody remembers yeah. and, <laughs> and uh, Johnny yeah. wanted me to do a documentary of him coming in and watching and his watching his film and so I uh, have a, a documentary of that which is a lot of fun and then I, I have one, you can just, uh, again, anybody wants to email me, I can send them a link to, to that one. <laughs> and quickly, I'd like to say, I'd like to thank the people that came to see Spark Club Cowboy. That was almost like a, um, uh, we had a preview and it was, it was free and we couldn't get more people in there. We had 130 people and it was like having a school reunion we had G Jim and Arlene, Sally Sanchez, Lynn, George and John Omley, Judy Aarons brought her whole family. That was really fun. Uh -huh. Kathy Carwell, Dennis Murphy, and I don't know who else. Lauren was there. Yeah. And I don't know who else I forgot, but it was really like a, you remember that, Lauren? It was like a yeah, school I do. reunion. Oh, yeah, that was really fun. I it still have a t-shirt. Uh-huh. Well, your video was great. I want to know where you got all those old cars. <laughs> oh, that, that were there? Yeah, yeah in that, that movie. There? Oh, in the they, movie? They crashed out at China, China Beach. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those cars. Where I got them? Yeah. Where I got them? Yeah. Uh, well, in those days, uh, I think we said in the movie, in those days, you could go out and buy a car. Uh, Jim Bataya, Jimmy might remember, you go out and buy a car for $15 <laughs> uh, all the way up to 15 Fifty dollars, <laughs> and and it was really a kick. And then we take them out to the flat track. Jim was out there, and Marty Coleman. Yeah. Um, you remember that, Jim? I don't know if he can hear you. I think he's taking the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about, and I do remember it. You you don't or do? I do. Oh, good, because I have the. I have a video of you in there throwing a, yeah, doing something, <laughs> throwing a hubcap or something. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, crazy times. So that's all I have to say. I just pass it on to the, the next person. <laughs> okay, Kramer, thank you so much. That's great. It's Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, you're, Kramer. You're our, uh, we're our first in line, and it's not easy to do that. I understand that. So thank you very much for pre preparing that with Phil and Phil, everything that you did. That's great. <laughs>